So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to be reading some questions and uh, reciting some answers that I wrote uh, to these questions uh, earlier uh, than this presentation. The questions come from my friend Pedro Marcus, a uh, uh, very dedicated uh, follower uh, and pursuer of meaningfulness in existence himself, uh, who has indeed suffered a great deal to understand better uh, the truth of the nature of reality. Uh, I consider him a worthy friend. Uh, his first question was, what is your opinion on fiction in general? My response was, I think fiction's social use value is artificially hyperinflated. It is encouraged because it serves the purpose of mindless entertainment, considered high art. Some have made the comparison of reading cheap fiction to mental masturbation, and it does serve the similar function of draining the novel reader's personal energy and time without any equally reciprocal reward. But fiction is far more dangerous than masturbation. As non-generative as masturbation may be, fiction poses a direct risk to the survival of all life. Fiction can be a portal through which evil may be realized. So Pedro's second question is, why is it evil? Why is it evil? Why is fiction evil? My reply is, fiction itself isn't necessarily evil. However, it tempts the creation of evil ex nihilo. It provides the illusion of a safe space for the author's imagination, where they may be free to dream up anything. Narrative fiction introduces structure to this realm that requires the character development of a protagonist or hero and an antagonist or villain. In narrative or novel fiction, conflict is necessary to drive the plot, and therefore any form of lasting peace is impossible. Insofar as peace is good, the structure of novels requiring conflict is, therefore, evil. Evil, in fiction, is considered harmless by libertines, but the truth is that well-developed villains are often more interesting to readers than their flatter, heroic counterparts. There can certainly be no denying that dystopias, written as terrifying warnings, are even right now inspiring a certain percentage of their readers to bring such visions about. Pedro's third question then is, when and how did you realize it is evil? So when and how did I realize that fiction is evil? My reply is, while I was in high school, I began building this theory, and by college I was seeking out any similar ideas as possible evidence. I read existentialist philosophers, mainly Nietzsche, Sartre, and Dostoevsky, in high school, and was moving into the postmodern thinkers by college. It was then I found a work called Literature and Evil by French philosopher George Bataille, 1897-1962. In this work, Bataille discusses the subject from the perspective of different earlier and contemporary authors, including Charles Baudrillard, Franz Kafka, and the Marquis de Sade, whom I'd already wor read works by. By that point, my initial opinion was even more solidified. By around the year 2000, when I graduated college, I was convinced I'd made a dangerous discovery. 
how controversial the idea was, I had yet to learn. So Pedro's next question, is all fiction evil or just some? And my reply, the potential for evil exists within the realm of fiction disproportionately to the amount of potential for evil that exists in reality. You cannot, in real life, break into and steal a car. In the video game world of Grand Theft Auto, the role of the character is car thief. In both realms, there are consequences for such an action. In Grand Theft Auto, they eventually call in the National Guard. In real life, they send you to prison. However, the fact that the video game realm is fiction means that no real-world consequences occur at all for one's actions. This is how it is for all authors of fiction. There are no prior laws. So Pedro's question following that is, if fiction is evil, do you see any alternative which would substitute this cultural phenomenon? And I say, sure, nonfiction. In places where math, science, and technical skills are emphasized, those places always become hubs for technology. Those places always become hubs for technology developers, tool builders, and inventors. Materialist philosophers, from the earliest atomists to modern astrophysicists, are those people willing to apply their creative genius to reality and to forego the temptation to unlimited power available to every author who enters into the realm of fiction. Pedro's next question. Did your view on God, the paranormal, and other such topics change at the same time your views on fiction change? Did you used to be a more mystically inclined person, and has that changed to a more materialist, philosophically inclined person? Firstly, I would specify between my reply. Firstly, I would specify between God and the paranormal. So called paranormal phenomenon can occur whether or not there is a God. Personally, I think the idea of a God is a fiction. The cosmos does not require a creator for the universe to have developed into what it is today. Humanity is not so special a species as to have been bred by ancient aliens, rather than having evolved over the many billions of years, etc. The more we discover to be true about nature, the less evidence we find for the idea of God. I've always doubted the idea of God, and this idea has always been one of my chief arguments about the evil of fiction. Pedro's next question is, can fiction be compared with drug use in any way? Which is more harmful, fiction or drugs? My reply, fiction is, for cultures, alike what poisonous and addictive drugs are for individuals. In cultures that value fiction, morals decline and eventually a class of authoritarian liars comes to power. Likewise, for an individual junkie, they will break laws to obtain their fix and lie about doing so to sustain their habit. In both cases, a mindset of scarcity is dominant, and this leads to the self-fulfilling prophecy that nothing is ever enough. The result of this culturally is counterfeit economics, and the result of this individually is psychological deterioration, where the junkie uses the drug to punish themselves for being hooked on the drug. Such periods when power junkies reign over a culture is called an empire, and for an individual addict, equivalent to hitting rock bottom. So Pedro asks, are you familiar with Alan Moore and his work? He is another comic writer who does magic, but interestingly, 
He has expressed more than one time his concern for adults more and more linking superhero comics and movies as he feels this is for kids and unhealthy. Do you agree with him? <coughs> of course, Alan Moore created The Watchmen, V for Vendetta, and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I'm particularly fond of one of his lecture halls in which he expressed dissatisfaction with his comic series being made into movies because, as he said, roughly, a comic can be made by one person with a paper and pencil. A movie takes hundreds of people to produce, and this leaves less room for independent creativity. Indeed, comics are meant for kids traditionally because they are meant to introduce children to the archetypes governing contemporary society. Just like toys or totems, such as the Native American Hopi tribe's Kachina dolls. When adults become obsessed by a genre meant traditionally to appeal to children, it is a sign of neoteny. The natural developmental curve of an individual or a group becomes stunted and held back, resulting in immature adult babies. The adulation of superheroes sets a dangerous precedent also in another perhaps unforeseen way. When George Reeves, 1914 to 1959, was playing Superman, a kid came up to him once confusing the actor for the character and aimed a loaded gun at the supposedly bulletproof superhero. Thus, the superpowers of the character almost cost the normal person pretending to be them their life. <coughs> Pedro goes on to say, You've mentioned to me once, fiction can be a kind of portal. Can you elaborate? My reply. Any book is a gateway to new knowledge. When you read nonfiction, what comes through is useful information, usually helping to one's own or one's species. Sorry. When you read nonfiction, what comes through is useful information, usually helpful to one's own or one's species survival. When you read fiction, by definition, everything that comes through is fiction, but people like to distinguish certain fictions as truths, even though they are not, e.g. God. Pedro says, considering other dimensions slash parallel universes, couldn't fiction be a reproduction of unconsciously received information by the author from these other worlds? My reply, if the many worlds interpretation is correct, then yes, absolutely. By that criteria, the dreams and fantasies we imagine are coming from parallel dimensional cosmoses to our own and those we experience more vividly or understand more easily are coming from parallel cosmoses nearer by us in the temporal multiverse, while more abstract ideas may be fished from cosmoses that are further away from our own mainstream timeline. I would say that inspirations come from a better possible future, while distractions lead one to focusing only on present and past conditions. Insofar as inspirations may arrive from elsewhere, so too many distractions, so too may distractions be a force pulling us down into our own universe's materiality from an inferior dimensional timeline. Pedro asks, Do you define yourself as a materialist? And I reply, not necessarily. When I wrote the MPDR in 2002, I was comparing ancient concepts about the soul and cosmology to modern scientific theories about the same. That work is undeniably metaphysics as a branch of philosophy, and traditionally, including modernly, metaphysics has been scorned by materialists as being too philosophical or even outright theosophical 
even though metaphysics preceded theosophy by thousands of years. Aside from the topics that interest me being anathema to modern materialism, I have no qualms with materialist science. Then again, I do not distinguish the paranormal as a separate typeset of phenomenology. Pedro asks, do you still think the paranormal is real? Specifically, hard stuff like PK, psychokinesis. Uh, skeptics would ironically consider this belief to be fiction. Yes, I think PK is possible given people's existing cerebral biology. Uh, telepathy is a commonplace effect once one stops ignoring it. Telepathy at a distance, or so-called remote viewing, is only one step away from PK, or so-called remote influencing. The persistence of one person to mind control another is evil, but it does work. Even remote MK could be considered a dull form of PK, where one is remote influencing the brain of their victim. Indeed, this is at the heart of fiction, the desire by an author to mind control their audience of readers and to convince them to suspend their disbelief and go along with an obviously false narrative. Again, this causes harm to a person's individual growth and development, whether it is consensual or not. Pedro asks, have you ever read the work of Grant Morrison? specifically The Invisibles, which deals with magic. In the first issue, John Lennon is invoked as a god form. Also, Morrison has written a book called Pop Magic and a book about the mythology of superheroes. He also tried to use a form of chaos magic with collective masturbation from the readers in order to boost the sales of this work and prevent its cancellation. my response. I am familiar with Grant Morrison as a comic creator, but nothing more than that. His works have not come across my radar as often as those of Moore, but I understand they are of equal stature in the field. Pedro asks, what did you think of the Harry Potter phenomenon at the time of its appearance? Me. Not much. I haven't read any of the books and I haven't seen any of the movies all the way through that I remember. I will say a school for teaching magic could only exist in the realm of fiction because magic, such as it is portrayed therein, is purely fictional. Magic in reality, from geomancy and dowsing to auguries and translating angelic languages, is very boring by comparison to its portrayal in novels like Harry Potter, let alone Moonchild. Pedro says, you've said you don't like interstellar and that the science portrayed there wasn't sound. Why? My response, if a black hole of that magnitude passed through our solar system, it would throw the planetary orbits into disarray. In interstellar, the hero falls into this black hole and survives, which is also all, an almost certain impossibility. They may have consulted black hole physicist Kip Thorne for the aesthetics, but the plot line is patently unrealistic. Pedro asks, what do you think of ufology? Has it become a kind of fiction, cult, or is it serious, or a mix of it all? Do you see it becoming, or having attempted to become, a kind of new folklore? And I reply, a UFO is just any unidentified flying object, of which there are thousands seen a day. However, the modern myth of ancient aliens does appear to be a Vatican psyop, much like Flat Earth becoming a resurgent trend on DARPAnet as a joke by NASA. The ancient beliefs in fallen angels and in pantheons of gods in general seeming nowadays to have been based on actual close encounters with extraterrestrials, is gaining popularity and even Vatican astronomer Reverend Jose Gabriel Funes claimed in 
2008, aliens are our brothers. It may be a ploy for modern authorities, the sciences, to merge alliances with the elder established authorities, such as the Catholic Church. This move would seem to indicate no actual benefit for the modern authorities. Pedro's next question. Did you like watching X-Files, and how did you feel about it then? And I reply. I did not watch it as a series when it was on TV. I tried to watch a few. Uh, that's funny. I tried to watch a few of the movies released after the series ended. The entire premise of an ancient alien virus evolving our own species into the aliens themselves, perhaps even into the aliens who, by traveling back in time, planted the original virus, is an interesting one as far as novel fiction goes and isn't too far off from the likely truth, although far more sensationalized. According to the theory of panspermia, an ancient alien virus-like life form could have crashed on Earth during the Archeon period, when Earth was mostly ocean, and begun assembling the local elements it found here into the earliest forms of single cellular biological organisms. Likewise, it seems apparent that the bacteriophage virus is the prototypical template for our own species' central nervous systems, at the least. Pedro says, A lot of your work deals in hyperdimensions. Do you view fiction, religion, and mysticism dealing with aspects of reality, or rather that defy reality, as a kind of bad interpretation of information received from hyperdimensions or tachyons, or rather hyperdimensions slash tachyons. And I say no. I tend to think of fiction as being that which obscures inspiration from any better possible future. Fiction is, by definition, however socially valued, still just lying. The truth as we know it now is comprised of facts about reality we've collected from aeons of observations. At best, fiction takes these observations and distorts them to fit the perspectives of competing characters. At worst, fiction ignores facts altogether and slaps reasoning, rational people in the face solely for the sake of provoking a reaction in them. Pedro asks, did you watch and like Star Trek, and what did you think of it? What do you think of Trekkies? And I reply, Adam Weishaupt, who invented the original Illuminati, was a Jesuit. He invented the Illuminati as a means of infiltrating and subverting Freemasonry, and promoted the Illuminati as the true or inner order of Masonry. Likewise, the radicalization of labor unionism into communism by Karl Marx was intended to destabilize the essentially Masonic foundations of modern Western society, principles of a free market and sound economic currency. Star Trek, being a more utopian science fiction set in the future, has, has many elements of an ideal Masonic society. It remains to be explored if this was intentionally done by Gene Roddenberry, and if so, for what motive. Star Trek IP covering the future of the Milky Way galaxy is more egalitarian and libertarian than the Star Wars IP set in a galaxy far, far away, and continues to offer modern technological futurists hope for space exploration. I grew up watching Star Trek TNG and DS9, but the plots of the recent reboot movies recasting William Shatner with Chris Pine as Captain Kirk still seem too confusing to me to accept yet as absolute canon. Pedro asks, What do you think of geek conventions, cosplaying, etc.? And I reply, Costuming and acting out the roles of heroic fictional characters is not a culturally new phenomenon, 
as I mentioned earlier about the Hopi Kachina dolls. The tribe also dressed as the Kachina pantheon themselves during the corn dance and other festivals. Apparently, even the evilest of the counterfeit elites cannot escape this proclivity for theatrical spectacle as they continue to meet annually at Bohemian Grove in California for the purpose of acting out plays and enacting a dramatic ceremonial ritual. The fact this practice, called play when engaged in by children in social groups, is so prevalent is testimony to the significance of the role fiction, lying, and playing pretend have in the cultural conditioning and indoctrination of children. As with that great lie of Christmas, Santa Claus exists. Children are taught lying as a positive part of maturing, and so, studies claim, liars make better leaders. As Joseph Campbell points out about the role of the mask as an archetype for false identity, its purpose isn't to be simply discarded as myth, but to be taken up by the youth and passed along from one generation to the next as a growing and evolving component fundamental to human society. I can simply imagine a world without it, and I believe it would have been a better world had the role of fiction never become amplified by such pseudo-philosophies as theology and belief in that ultimate great lie of religion that God exists. Pedro says, you've written fiction yourself and you continue to make it available for download. Why and how do you feel about what you wrote today? And I reply, <clears throat> well, let's look at that shelf on, well, let's look at that shelf of my works. In my folders, it's labeled as fiction and young adult literature in between poetry and children's books and philosophy and PhD level content. Right now, there are 15 works of mine in this folder. So yes, you can claim I have written fiction. Of this fiction and young adult category, five are derivatives, my own compilations or writings about other people's works of fiction including works on The Blair Witch Project, Donnie Darko, The Matrix, Star Wars, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Of the remaining 10 works, three are collections of philosophical essays and notes, Notebook 1, High School Years, BenPatioVersusATS.com, and I Am Now Me which I consider too speculative to be considered specifically nonfiction. Of the remaining seven left after those, two are expressly comedy, Leroy Jenkum and For a New World Order, and two are original scripts, Intuitive Continuum and Apocalypse 2029. The final remaining three are fictional novels, the Cult of Sleep and the Neo-Sethians, God, and the Cheshire Sam Trilogy. The Cheshire Sam Trilogy describes a dystopian future world I associate in my work overall with the worst possible future timeline. God is one-half background essays and rants on speculative subjects, but the back half of it is a traditional novel written in the style of Sitchin's Lost Book of Enki and meant to pick up in modern times where his story of the ancient Anunnaki left off. The Neosethian work is probably my most problematic because it does not express itself as obvious fiction, but then devolves into paranoid rants gradually over the course of it. Each of these works had its reasons, but only the Neosethian work has brought me trouble because many people are first introduced to my work through it, and it tends to attract paranoid and psychotic fans. Pedro says, Please share a little about your personal history with fiction, nerd-slash-geek culture, comic books, superheroes, sci-fi, etc. And I reply, 
Well, I grew up in the peak era of American imperialism. So there was plenty of surplus wealth and industrial manufacturing of toys to placate my young mind. I enjoyed the Star Wars RPG as a kid, and I still have my complete comic book collection of over a thousand issues, mostly Marvel. My favorite toys were Transformers because they were each like a little puzzle, and I had a very large collection of many different types of action figures, from Star Wars to Battle Beasts to comic book characters, etc. When I was in first grade, I decided I wanted to be a comic book artist when I grew up, and from ages 10 to 20, I continually drew art in comic book format. As I said, it wasn't until high school, reading works by humanity's so-called greatest philosophical thinkers, that I began to realize what psychological damage fiction causes. And again, this came from exploring authors like William Burroughs and Robert Anton Wilson, as well as the aforementioned Kafka and de Sade. By the end of high school, I'd had my fill of fiction, and by the end of college, of philosophy and poetry as well. Pedro asks, you consider Stephen King evil. Why? We learn of Dr. Frankenstein as a fictional villain someone who plays God and invents monsters. But in real life, many, wrongly, idolize popular horror authors like Stephen King, who are real-world Dr. Frankensteins, bringing hosts of imaginary monsters to life in the minds of otherwise innocent readers. Again, I can imagine a world without horror novelists and without the idea of God and I feel it would be a better world than the one we are living in today. And to be clear, I don't think Stephen King is evil in the same sense as, say, Jeffrey Epstein was evil. However, I do believe he exploits the temptation of all fictional authors to play God and to create new monsters. In this regard, he's far from being a perfect person, but again, probably less evil than many others. Pedro asks, what are your thoughts on the occult and magic today? Is it just psychological or does it tap into the paranormal? What do you think about using fictional concepts in magic? Kenneth Grant and others are known to have incorporated the Necronomicon mythos in real magical practice. He even says it exists as an astral book. Magic is potentially extremely harmful to one's sanity, depending on one's random luck with harvesting results. Two people can share one magical ritual and experience totally different results from it. Magic, as an attempt to systematize superstitions, is a valid field of study even though superstition is false. Trying to figure out if and how magical rituals work to yield results, is considered the great work among magi throughout the aeons. Discarding their work as mere superstition is tantamount to discarding all myths as being bereft of any metaphysical meaning or possibility for a moral message, i.e., it is a false premise. Just as myths can have correspondences to reality, as any form of historical fiction must, so is there some social function in the psychosomatic effect of ritual magic. I, sus I suspect the same portions of the brain stimulated by ritual magic are also stimulated by superstition, myth, and fiction generally, but this remains unproven. Pedro says, what do you think about Jung's interpretation of religion and unusual experiences as archetypes, a kind of genetic memory of primordial images? And I reply, I've only read Jung in passing, and I can't really give you a too in-depth analysis of that. I read Man and His Symbols and his essay on synchronicity in high school. 
But many of the new revelations coming to public light about his works and beliefs, such as his Red Book Grimoire, I am less aware of. <coughs> as I recall, Jung's idea of the collective unconscious always made me wonder if such a phenomenon could become a collective conscious. But I have not studied his works enough to know if there is any answer to that question in them. His archetypes are only a modernization of the Gnostic concept of the archons, world rulers, or the Sumerian concept of the Anunnaki, underworld judges. I'm going to pause here and come back into a second part of this, uh, which gets into more personal questions uh, that Pedro asked me. So for now, I'm just going to cut and take a drink of water and then restart in a moment. I'll see you then. 